Hello, I'm Charlotte Enns from the Faculty of Education, and this is Mandy McDonald, and she's going to be interpreting my talk into American Sign Language. As an educator, I am very interested in how children learn. And in particular, I'm interested in how deaf children learn. Even more specifically, my research is focused on how deaf children learn language. I first became interested in this area when I was training to become a speech-language therapist. In my university classes, the emphasis was on fixing the problem, helping deaf children learn how to, uh, using, with using hearing aids and application, helping them to learn how to speak and listen. At the same time, however, I was invited to attend events within the deaf community. And in these situations, I was the only one who needed fixing because everyone there was communicating extremely effectively through sign language. What motivates me in my work is that I have met many intelligent deaf children who struggle to learn in school and do not read and write well. This is such an injustice. And as an educator, I feel it is my responsibility to do something and try to resolve that issue. One of the things that I realized when there was this contrast between fixing the problem of deaf children and the deaf community and sign language is that that was a huge realization for me in terms of my perception of language, what language really means, and it opened me up to a much broader understanding of diversity and difference. One of the things that I want to emphasize today is that the solution around why this is such an injustice for deaf children and their inability to read and write well is that it's, the solution lies in early language acquisition. And this language does not need to be a spoken language. Sign languages are equally capable of providing the necessary foundation for later learning. Language is fundamental to what makes us human. Language connects our thoughts with the people and the world around us. And as Vygotsky claimed, Language is our most important tool for mediating our learning. During the first five years of a child's life, it is the most important time for the brain to process language input patterns. This is a critical period, and if we don't acquire our first language during that time, we will have difficulties in the future. It must, it, this is, we need exposure to accessible, rich language through, from a variety of different communication partners. And this is not something that children can make up for later in life. If they don't get it in those first five years, they will have problems developing higher level thinking skills and they will have difficulty learning to read and write. I want to make a distinction here between the terms speech and language, because although they are often used to mean the same thing, and they do tend to occur at the same time, they actually have very different meanings. Speech is simply the ability to uh, produce sounds through your mouth. Language, on the other hand, is all what we understand and use in terms of words, grammar, and conversational skills. Language includes all the words we know, how we put those words into sentences, and how we use those sentences to express our thoughts and feelings. Speech is one way to express language 
but it is not the only way. Language can be expressed through writing and through signs. Sign languages use facial expressions and different positions and shapes and movements of the hands to express meaning and ideas. Sign languages, studies have shown that sign languages function in a very similar way to spoken languages. They can be used to request or to command, argue, persuade, and even tell jokes or express feelings or create poetry. So in this way, it is language, not speech, that is the key to making friends, developing our thinking and learning, and doing well in school. So although spoken languages and sign languages function in a similar way, there are differences in how they are structured because we process one of them with our ears and the other with our eyes. Spoken languages uh, organize sounds consecutively because it is difficult for a person to hear two sounds at the same time. Louder sounds will block out the other sounds. So spoken languages are organized sequentially with one sound following another in order to accommodate this kind of processing. Speech sounds are added to words or words are added to sentences to change or alter meaning. By contrast, visual languages use or we process visual information spatially and simultaneously. This means that when we see things, we remember where they're located and we can see two or more things at the same time. Sign languages take advantage of this visual processing and use space and movement to change to layer grammatical structures and change meaning. So, for example, in American Sign Language, the sign for weight is like this. By adding a simple elliptical movement over the sign, like this, the meaning is changed to wait for a long time or waiting and waiting. I should uh, clarify here that just as there are many different spoken languages in the world, there are many different communities of deaf people who use a variety of different signed languages. However, all sign languages are based on the same principles of visual processing, and so there are similarities across different sign languages. For example, many sign languages use a forward motion to indicate something that will happen in the future, and a backwards motion to indicate events that have happened in the past. So just as spoken languages are organized to fit with the sequential processing of sounds, visual uh, sign languages are organized to fit with the way we process, we take in and make sense of information with our eyes. Okay, so the way we process information with our eyes or our ears definitely shapes spoken and signed languages and how they're structured. But what is really important to mention is that all language learning is really about the mind. Whether we perceive language through our eyes or our ears, or we express it with our hands or our mouth, the brain processes all language input in a similar way. And we know this because children learning a signed language go through the same developmental stages that children go through when they're acquiring a spoken language. And that includes a stage of babbling. 
So children learning sign language use rhythmic and repetitive movements of their hands and fingers before they use real signs. We now have evidence from neuroscience, and specifically the studies conducted by Laura Ann Petito and her colleagues, that confirm that signed and spoken languages are processed in the exact same part of the brain. Sign languages show us that it is not sound and speaking that make human language unique, but the systematic patterns of natural languages and the fact that we are biologically programmed to decode them that make language unique. This makes up our human capacity for language. So, these two points, the critical period for language acquisition and the fact that the brain processes spoken and signed language in similar ways, reinforce the urgency for early dual language, both signed and spoken, exposure for deaf children. We need to make sure that their brains get enough and the right kind of input so that they, during those very few short years, so that they can acquire language. Because very often at this stage, we don't know how much speech they can actually hear, let alone understand. Dual language input is only possible when we stop seeing the deficit and shift to a different perspective. Their sign languages have shown us that many everyday assumptions that we have about language, and particularly its relationship to speech, were based on misconceptions. If we truly value, when, if we truly value human diversity, we will build on deaf children's visual strengths and ensure that they have access to early, accessible and meaningful language so that they too can reach their full potential. Thank you. <laughs>